Uh, so, thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, I know a lot of you already, you know me, but for uh, those who don't know me, my name is Sean Blanchfield. I suppose I'm a, a career entrepreneur, um, which for me roughly translates into only very rarely have I had a boss and I didn't really like it very much. Um, so I've uh, started a few companies, uh, I suppose that's all I've ever done. In college, uh, I started a company with two other guys called Forest, which is still running, and does management software for salons, of all things. Um, <laughs> Then, uh, so that was actually as undergrads. Uh, as a postgrad, I dropped out of my postgrad to start a company called Demonware, which is the main sponsor of this event. And that was great fun, video games and all that kind of stuff. Four years into that, the company was bought by Activision Blizzard, the biggest games company in the world, and we were all, we were all very happy. Um, about 12 months after that, I, I left that company, in fact, and started looking for new things to do. Uh, I teamed up with one of the speakers uh, some of you might have seen yesterday, uh, Brian McDonnell, who was talking about the async programming frameworks. And we started doing anything we could think of. We started off uh, trying to do a, a tax web app, because uh, we thought that was cool for some reason. Didn't last very long. <laughs> we moved into social games. We acquired a game called Utopia, and we rebuilt it in Python. It was an old uh, web-based game from 1998, originally written in, someone recognizes that, originally written in uh, Delphi. Uh, by a Texan guy in his bedroom uh, as he was learning to code. And we took that and rewrote it all in Python, which took about three times longer than we thought, and that was the whole of 2009, as it turned out. Um, and then we got more and more into social games and ended up using social games as a training tool uh, in businesses. Um, and that company is, is uh, still going. Um, <coughs> um, but uh, let's see, that brings us up to 2010, at which point Brian and I decided to take a different approach altogether. And that's when we started uh, Scalefront. And this is a different kind of company. We don't actually have a product um, or any particular service. Instead, this is our uh, limited company for starting companies from. So it's our, our own incubator, and that's the idea behind that. Um, so we're calling it a, a startup lab. And I think this is an increasing trend that you see. Um, well, you got the gist of that slide. It'll come back in a minute. Um, yeah, so there's some companies in the States that are doing this kind of thing. Rather than starting individual companies, they're starting companies to start companies. And that allows at very, very early stages of a startup to be a bit more efficient. So you have don't have to do all the legals every single time and all the accountancy every single time, but you just do that stuff when the thing gets serious and you want to spin it out into its own company. Anyway, <coughs> so uh, that's basically what I've been doing. When uh, Vicky and Michael asked me to do a keynote, um, I actually didn't have to think very hard about what I wanted to speak about. Um, it's something I've been thinking about for a while. So. Uh, Basically, I wanted to try and convince as many people as possible to do what I'm doing and start a startup. And uh, I just don't want to be another guy who's just trying to tell you to do what I'm doing because I think it's great, because it's the only thing I know, which you know, I'm definitely liable to do. Um, <clears throat> but actually, I have a kind of careful rationale uh, behind the career that I've chosen, and I'd like to tell you why. And <clears throat> so, so to delve into that a little bit more, uh, it gets a little bit philosophical. I've always been a philosophical guy. As a kid, I was worried about you know, dying and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so from a kind of meaning of life and philo philosophy point of view, um, for me, doing startups is kind of like about trying to create meaning in your life and trying to find a way to spend uh, your years as wisely as possible while you have them and make the biggest impact possible. Um, <clears throat> a kind of shorthand I have for this is uh, to think about an old version of me and how he looks at the world. Um, let's see if my clicker works. First outing. That's my uh, best Photoshop impersonation of myself uh, in the future. <laughs> I actually grew a beard for this. <laughs> Shaved it off last week. Um, <clears throat> so in my, in, in my head, I'm trying to think, you know, what is this old guy? What's he thinking? And how's he looking back at life? Um, you know, and I can kind of speculate about a few things. You know, hopefully he's looking back at something like 60 years of adulthood uh, doing stuff, and he's probably thinking, you know, what kind of impact have I made? What do I leave behind? He probably thinks, you know, 60 years was too short. Um, you know, like there's, when you consider the vast, you know, ge geological age of the universe, um, or you consider, you know, the whole of human culture and history so far, and all of the stuff that's been left behind by, you know, the 50, 50 billion odd people or so who've lived and died at various points. You know, it's, it's a very short amount of time. And I reckon, you know, him being me, what I would think is it's really important to use that little window of time as well as possible. 
So I guess he's wondering if he did, which is to say if I did. And that's the way I've been looking at the world. Maybe he's thinking about, cool, you know, grandkids, got family, I'm leaving that behind. Or maybe he's thinking about what he did professionally and what he's leaving behind in terms of, of work, and hopefully both. <coughs> now, him being me, I know a lot about what he's thinking. I know he's not very religious. He doesn't believe in any kind of, uh, I suppose, objective uh, meaning of life handed down by a god. Um, I have a little Monty Python picture for that one. <laughs> and uh, he doesn't even think that's calculable by uh, a giant planet-sized computer operated by space mice. So without any of that, it's a, it's a little bit liberating. If you don't believe there's an objective meaning of life handed down by you know, the universe, you can actually choose your own and decide, you know, how am I going to spend my life? Um, <clears throat> so this is what I want to talk about today. Oh, look, they disappear as well. Um, so it's going the wrong way. This is the shorthand. I don't want to piss old me off, right? And that's what, that's what uh, this talk is about. Maybe you want to translate that into your own terms. So <clears throat> let's see. What do I have next? Cool. So roughly speaking, um, I think this guy looking at everyone in this room and myself, right, we're all programmers. To be a programmer in Dublin uh, at this time in history is an amazing thing. We've, I want to go into a few details about some of the changes that I've just seen in 10 years of trying to start companies. And to think about uh, you know, the, the very privileged position that that leaves us all in, both in terms of history and geography. So to start off, <coughs> I want to think about, uh, so I started Demonware roughly about 10 years ago. And uh, well, the first, so this is a VC funded company, right? We, had, we, we raised half a million bucks somehow. Uh, don't know who gave that to us or, or why, considering we're basically just students with no products and no customers. But we managed. And the first thing we needed to do was set up. And in 2003, that was still something that took quite a bit of time. The first thing we needed to do was to buy two kilometers of network cable and wire through our building so that we could connect our computers to something. Next off, we started buying servers, right? So we wanted to have email, uh, not our old TCD addresses, and preferably not like our Ireland Online addresses or whatever was popular at the time. So we bought a server, and we had to set up an email server. And then we wanted source control, so we bought a server, and we set up a CVS, if anyone remembers that, on that server. <laughs> Um, let's see, for file sharing, we needed to just have some basic IT infrastructure, so we had file servers set up, and I'm sure I'm leaving something out. Web server, yes, we actually had a server connected in that had our website on it. It was those days. Um, so even just to start off, there is like this basic infrastructural cost. We spent a few weeks and maybe about 10 grand buying servers and network cable and all that kind of crap. Um, that's not something you need to do anymore, right? You start off, it's free. You use cloud stuff, Git, GitHub, um, G, uh, Gmail, <coughs> Dropbox, and so on, right? So that kind of initial setup cost doesn't exist anymore. But it, even more, so that was, that's, a, that's really only uh, an initial cost at the outset. In a more serious way, as some of you might know, what Demoware basically ended up doing was uh, web services for games, right? It's a bit more fancy than that, and there's a lot more in it, but. Uh, basically, you know, it's highly scal scalable web services. Nowadays, it's, you know, <coughs> it's fairly commonplace, and you can Google how to create highly scalable web service style stuff. When we were creating it, there wasn't much of that, much of that support available um, <coughs> to, to host this stuff, because you know, we were planning for hundreds of thousands and millions of gamers online. Um, well, there was no cloud, no cloud hosting yet, so we had to start thinking about buying servers and getting them into data centers and you know, figure out, figuring out what data centers to partner with and what peering relationships they had with other data centers and getting to all this stuff. And very quickly, that turned into a couple of full-time jobs. And we had a sysadmin team uh, who had a big, spent a lot of their time actually just dealing with people in data centers and complaining about memory being corrupt or someone pulled a cable back stint and all that kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> Another thing you just don't get anymore. So just to operate a business, we had a, like a high fixed cost, which you, know, you just don't see anymore. You put it on Amazon or Roku or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so that's dropping IT costs. Another thing to compare to just 10 years ago is how we actually went about development. We were, in, we were still in a, in a land of static languages for the most part. Uh, we mainly use C++. Most other people were using Java. Uh, C Sharp was, I suppose, getting popular. Um, but the basic productivity in your language is fairly low. I know myself, when I moved to Python around 2006, I suddenly, I don't know, became 
maybe three or five times more productive on any given task. Would that be about what other people's uh, yeah, nodding heads? I'd say three to five times more productive. Um, <clears throat> but you know, 10 years ago and more, that really wasn't an option for people. Then there was uh, surrounding tools. Um, we were still shipping you know, binaries. For us, we were business to business, so we were sending like, binary files to people, and that's the executables, or the, or the libraries or DLLs that they'd integrate. Other people were shipping uh, you know, consumer software based on disks. You had very, very long uh, <coughs> iteration cycles. So there are all the productivity uh, you know, bonuses that we've got from moving towards continuous integration and shorter release cycles basically weren't available back then because the way you shipped your software wasn't like that. And then in addition, you know, nowadays we, have things, we, we are often doing web apps or mobile apps that are const constantly on online or something close to that. <coughs> we rely a lot on third-party tools that are hosted that we can just build in to our applications. So, I mean, when I'm developing nowadays, mainly it's web apps and a huge part of you know, the functionality I put in, I just roll in from third parties. So basically I'm, I'm composing an app out of third party stuff. That was still a pipe dream people talked about in academia 10 years ago, but now we just do it, and I don't think we re really realize that we've realized that dream. <coughs> so um, our productivity has shot through the roof <coughs> in 10 years. Our costs have fallen through the floor, and our individual productivity has shot through the roof, which is pretty cool. There's another key trend I think that's happened, which is, uh, you know, I think actually revolutionary. We'll rewind 10 years again, right? We, we were business to business, so we probably had it pretty easy uh, in terms of getting to our customers. What we did is we flew to our customers and we tried to get meetings with them. Um, you know, we turned up at the door to studios like Raven in Madison, Wisconsin, and other crazy places like that with six laptops, laptops saying, we're here to give you a demo over lunch. And that just kind of worked out. But it was pretty expensive. You know, people, key people from the company, had to full-time basically be on planes traveling around studios. That's a very expensive way to get at your customers. We also did conferences, and doing conferences is expensive. The cheapest we got it done for was maybe about 20 grand, but we were doing it against people who were spending hundreds of grand on any given conference to try and get exposure to customers. <clears throat> and that was the good end, that's business software. 10 years ago and more, think about what consumer software was. It was about selling compact, compact disks in stores. It's just bizarre to think about that, uh, considering where we are today. Compact disks, I mean, have you seen one recently? at all, you know? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the nature of actually after you had created some software 10 years ago, trying to get it into anyone's hands was very, very challenging. Maybe you have to think about distribution, you know? Who's gonna actually distribute my discs or print them for me or whatever, you know? <clears throat> in terms of actually informing the audience, if you didn't get like a really good spot in the store, maybe in front of the door in one of those stands, you know, what are you gonna do? Maybe you have to go wine and dine some journalists somewhere and get into the PC magazines and get listed. But today, where are we, right? There's, two, there's a couple of major trends. We've moved to web apps, largely, or mobile apps. So the friction between knowing that it exists and beginning to use it is normally one step or two steps. There's no getting in your car and driving somewhere or whatever. So by going, creating the, uh, the applications actually on the web itself, it's, it's like a much faster experience to get the users to adopt your stuff. But in terms of actually informing them, we have all these new tools. You know, we have social networks now. Um, we have search um, and very targeted advertising, things that, we, that you know, <clears throat> just really weren't readily available uh, 10 years ago. So, uh, wait for this to come back. We have this third uh, amazing trend, which is our ability to cheaply reach a huge audience. Uh, actually, it hasn't just gone to the roof, it, it's coming to the existence. It com it's coming to existence, really, for the first time that as an individual, you can essentially access a global audience by yourself without any major uh, you know, <clears throat> independent company pumping hundreds of millions of or millions of dollars into you. So if you consider these three together, I'd actually make an argument that this is unprecedented in history for any kind of maker, for any profession or trade or artist, that only recently in the last few years have we as programmers you know, gained the combination of these things where at essentially zero cost, we can very quickly, quickly create something that solves a problem and get it, it, get it into the hands of millions of people, maybe hundreds of millions, or maybe billions of people, maybe not billions, not yet, but hundreds of millions potentially. I mean, no one could do this. I heard recently, you know, uh, Charles Dickens in his day, right, was the most popular author, you know, of the Victorian era, and is still a very well-known guy, and we all know who he was. <clears throat> For him to write a book was expensive 
and took a long time. And the maximum distribution any of his books ever got was 70,000. You know, any of us can do better than that. We're all Charles Dickinson's, all Charles Dickinson's now, which is kind of cool, right? <clears throat> so, let's see. Um, that's one trend. Well, so all of this ties together for me into thinking that from an historical context, we as programmers suddenly, just in the last couple of years, are in an unprecedented position in history. We're incredibly lucky. But there's a second thing, and that's geography. Um, <clears throat> this drop in cost for startups has led to um, well, increased, uh, the drop in cost in technology has led to in an increased uh, independence for us. Right? We don't need to be close to the, to the money anymore. Historically, all of the money has been in Silicon Valley, over there somewhere. Um, and that's where people over the last 60 years have understood technology and had to spend money on innovation. But uh, because we don't need the money so much anymore, the startups are moving out of Silicon Valley and just springing up wherever it really makes sense for the founders. You know, may maybe it makes sense to be close to your customers or just close to where your family is or where you like to live or wh whatever it is. But startups, startup hubs are springing up all over the world wherever there's population centers to support them. So that's kind of happened. And that's like the last five years or so, something like that. So you're looking at uh, spreading out of, Cali out of um, <clears throat> Northern California, out of the valley, down into LA. You hear about LA a lot now. You hear about New York. Uh, in terms of Europe, you hear a lot about uh, Stockholm, Berlin, London, Paris, Barcelona, and Dublin. You hear a lot about Dublin. Just from the point of view of Dublin itself, uh, Myself and Vinnie Glennon, who probably a bunch of you know, uh, co-launched uh, startupwiki.ie, which is just a wiki to try and collate resources for startups. Uh, we did that in, in August. And then I put up some Amazon Turk tasks to try and collate uh, how many startups might actually be in Dublin. So basically taking lots of official lists and trying to get them into one place. And so far we've found 350 startups in Dublin. Um, now that's 350 startups that must represent just a small fraction of what's actually there. Those are the ones that have made it onto an official list of some kind. Yeah, and some of them are actually out of business already, so maybe it's slightly less than 350. But the real number is probably close to 1,000, um, with people at just being at different stages of their business. And those are companies that just weren't there before. Um, <clears throat> like, I, I know for myself, in, in Demonware, when we were starting out, we knew like three other companies that were at the same stage. You know? Nowadays, there's a huge community. And I think actually, you know, uh, <clears throat> Python.ie is actually part of that community because the technology groups and startup groups are so closely interdependent. But on any given night, you normally have a, a choice of things to go to, and it's, it's impossible to go to all of the startup events and tech events that are on. So um, it's really happening here in Dublin. But it gets better because when you look at the mac macros in this map, right, you have North America, which really is in, in an undisputed way the innovation leader in the world. All of the best companies still come from there. They've just got a lot more experience. Going back right, right through the Cold War to the 50s, they've been doing tech companies. They know how to do companies. They know what's required from a culture point of view. They have a big bed of experience in terms of running them. And they have lots of capital that can be that's spent you know, more wisely than elsewhere in the world on that kind of thing. But they're getting kind of squeezed on talent in terms of programmers. Um, <clears throat> and also, they have actually more money, more capital chasing startups than there are startups to take the money. right? So if you have a good startup, uh, you, like there's money there for you. Uh, lots of people don't have good startups, but anyway. Um, Europe has a strong talent pool, something that America strongly needs. So in terms of where all the startup hubs are springing up, there is uh, Europe needs America and America needs Europe. And sitting in between the two of them is us, which is kind of cool. We, we are, I think, the most business friendly uh, country in Europe. You know, we're happy to do business in whatever way they want to do business. We'll abandon any business culture we had in order to do business like the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> we have all of the big companies here, you know. We have, we, we punch ridiculously, but we have a disproportionate number of international software companies here, considering how many of us there actually are. So I think what we're going to see over the next few years is, so expertise and money in America, talent over here, and we'll be the gateway between the two. I think it's very likely that over the next few years, all the European startups and those European startup hubs will begin to cycle through Dublin in order to get more American exposure and international exposure. So we can be the launch pad, the global launch pad for European 
uh, startups, which puts us in the middle of all of that. <coughs> so there you go. In terms of both history and geography, uh, we're in you know, the best position we possibly could be in. Let's see. So <coughs> I did all that from memory, turn it. Oh yeah, this bit. So another old, another old guy said something once, you know, with uh, great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> so if we, if we are this privileged, then what should we be doing with it? Um, obviously, you know what I think. Uh, in terms of what I do on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis, I do quite a lot of consulting with other startups and a lot of hiring. And through that hiring, I know that a lot of great programmers in the city, maybe most of them, are actually working for the really big software companies. You know? And it's not very surprising. You know, they're you know, <clears throat> very talented and they get paid best there. But I would argue that that's possibly a poor use of their time in terms of making an impact. In a big software, a big international software company as a programmer, you will generally get to nibble around the edges of an existing uh, product line, <coughs> making incremental improvements. When anyone who's there has the ability to go into a smaller company and build something where nothing existed before and solve a problem for people who, could, who were suffering from that problem and had no solutions previously. So <coughs> I think you can make a, I think it's better to be, you know, making, solving a big problem in a small company than a small problem in a big company, so to speak. So, Here's what I, this is what I'm here to try and convince you of today. I know a lot of you are actually in startups, you know, um, already, but you know, that's my case for uh, those of you who aren't. What I'd like to do now actually is to like, talk a little bit about startups itself um, and some of the like, you know, key things I've taken away from the last decade or so of doing, doing them in terms of you know, how to approach it or get started. Um, <coughs> so uh, let's see. Hmm. Cool. <coughs> So we're talking about making a dent in the universe, roughly, right? As Steve Jobs would say, um, and how uh, insanely lucky we are to be in a position to do that. Um, the startups, I think, in terms of putting a dent in the universe, startup is the best vehicle to do it in, right? And I'm kind of saying that in contrast to an open source project. I think they're great, right? And we all use tons of open source, and we rely on that as part of the ecosystem. But in terms of going after a specific problem and trying to make an impact, as quickly as possible. A startup is highly commercial. In a startup, you need to pay people. And the only way to pay people is to get other people to pay you, which means everyone in your startup immediately focuses in on trying to create enough value for someone that they'll actually hand over the cash. So in a startup, you end up with this amazing commonality of purpose that I don't think you really see very frequently in any other kind of company, especially bigger companies or bigger organizations, where everyone's clearly focused on how to create value for the customer to get to that point where they'll hand over some cash so people can get paid. And uh, I, I don't think it's really too mercenary. You know, pe when people hand over the cash uh, you know, willingly, you know, like you're not stealing it off them, it means that you're actually solving a problem and it's your form of feedback that you're actually making progress. So um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, in terms of what a startup, like uh, the other benefits around startups, uh, it's a very recognizable format. So compared to doing an independent project or just something by yourself and keeping it quiet or doing a, an open source project, a startup is a format that people understand, okay, you're commercial. Investors understand how to put money in, in there to try and get you going. Uh, journalists can know how to write about you. Um, there's suddenly like a whole new bookshelf in the library or in, the, in Hodges Figures or whatever that applies to you and you can read and you can take the lessons out of. So a startup is kind of like a particular format of an organization that you know, is understood and tailored for this and there's just tons of support for. And as programmers, all of us have a huge advantage to creating startups. Any of us could independently start a startup without anyone else's help. You can't say the same for business people because they can't program, right? It, it, go, it only goes one way, right? The business stuff is mostly common sense. You can pick it up really, really quickly. You know, it's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> It is common sense. You just try and sell something for more money than it costs you to make it, right? Now you're in business. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, from a programming point of view, uh, it's much tougher if you have a background in business and you try to convert to programming. Because it's a deep skill, it involves an aptitude that actually just a minority of people have in the first place. And it takes you years and years and years of experience to get good at it. Um, so, uh, you know, 
Startups should be started, I think, by tech people. But we need to adjust our thinking slightly. So uh, to delve into that a bit more, what is a startup? Uh, when I started out, I thought a startup was just a company, just a small company that was owned by us. And that's not a very useful definition. I think a lot of startups aren't even companies. <laughs> I think it's irrelevant whether it's a legal company or not. A startup is about a group of people looking for the formula for a business. There's different ways of saying this, and there's no formal definition, but people are converging on this one. That it's not actually a business, but it's a group of people who are trying to figure, cr like crack the formula for a business. So it's a search for a repeatable business model. And what I'm emphasizing there is that a startup generally doesn't know what it's doing or what its business is. Right? If it did, it would actually be a business. So you could start a coffee shop, for instance. You wouldn't call that a startup because you know what the rules are, you know what the formula is. You could open a coffee shop, you put it on a busy street, people want coffee, you know, you know what the product is, how to package it, how much people are willing to pay. You know, there's, you're, not really, you're not really figuring anything out there, you just have a small business. But in a startup, normally there's something new that hasn't been done before. Like you have a new technology, or you have a new kind of customer, or you're trying to bring a technology and make it relevant to a new kind of customer for the first time. Right? Which means that you don't know anything about how to present the technology, what it looks like in the product form, how much to charge for it, how much people are willing to pay for it, uh, what way to charge them, you know, upfront or subscription or, or advertising or, or whatever. <coughs> so it's all those combinations that are about creating a fit between the product and a market. That's, that's the bit that the startup's about. And once you crack that, you can just call yourself a business. And in fact, once you crack that, it gets a lot less interesting, and you might just like step aside and let someone with an MBA take over. And that happens very often. So <clears throat> that's roughly, uh, you know, just to set it out what I think a startup actually is. And that's, that's a really fun bit, where you're creating lots of value, cracking the formula for the first time. <clears throat> so if you, uh, if you like the sounds of this kind of startup thing, you're going to need some kind of mission to get going on. And this question of how you find a mission. You know, a startup has to be trying to do something roughly, even if you don't know the details. So um, as technologists and as, as programmers, uh, we're all kind of inclined to start with a piece of tech we think is really cool, um, and then go around hunting for uh, solutions we can, or problems we can solve with that piece of tech, right? And trying to jam it in there. Um, and so this bit of advice I'm going to give you is going to fall, first of all, on my deaf ears, and then your deaf ears. But that's completely the wrong way to go about it. Um, if you do that, and I've done it in the past, what happens is you have a cool piece of tech and you hunt around for a customer, and the first person who doesn't tell you to piss off ends up being your market, right? And you end up kind of deep diving on that, and who knows what it is, right? So I'm going to pick a case of the uh, first person who says, yeah, maybe I'll have that as like an optometrist. Now you're the optometrist software company, right? <laughs> and that's fine. It's not a terrible result. It's actually pretty good to get customers at all. But the, the thing is, you didn't actually set out to choose them. Maybe they weren't the best market in the first place for you. Maybe optometrists don't have much money for software, or are really technically incompetent or something. I don't know. I um, <clears throat> hope there's no optometrists or people from optometrist, optometrist families here. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> boy, whereas if you, like a better way to do it is to think, OK, I'm a smart tech guy. I can solve problems, and go around trying to find you know, a place where there's lots of frustration, right? And we all have frustrations. Each of us day to day get, you know, kind of pissed off at little things. You know, we have families, all of whom are frustrated at day to day things in work and in life. We have colleagues, we have friends. So <clears throat> the trick uh, that I find useful is whether I'm in a pub or just on the phone or whatever, I, begin, I write down what people are annoyed about. And behind every frustration, there's normally some kind of business idea. And if you get into the habit of doing this, you'll end up with a long list of possible businesses, business ideas, most of which will be complete garbage. But some of them will shine. And uh, you just review it every so often. And you'll say, well, OK, these three, you know, they're both cool, and they're in a market full of rich people <laughs> who I can get to, right? And that, that's a really good combination. So in, in Scalefront, because we're doing this as a process now, this is the first question we ask, you know, um, you know what's that market? Is, is it big enough to bother going after in the first place? And we try and do it that way around. In the meantime, we just try and write every, every single business idea, every frustration down, and any business idea down that we can think of. So we have a big, long list to choose from all of the time. Um, <clears throat> so with your big, long list, you can then have your favorites. You go to the pub or coffees or whatever. You chat with other people about it. And once you find yourself being able to make other people get really passionate about it as well as just you, you probably have your mission. You have something that's 
exciting that you can get excited over and you can get other people excited over. And that's a great place to be. <coughs> and that's where you can start. Then the next thing you need is founders, other people to found it with. So the stats unfortunately say that single founder companies are far more, far more likely to fail than, than companies that have more than one founder in them. And <coughs> uh, the people who figured that one out didn't come up with the reasons, but you know, it seems fairly intuitive to me. The thing is, starting a startup is a kind of roller coaster journey emotionally. You know, you have crazy ups and crazy downs every day in terms of setbacks and, and great things that happen. And because you're doing something brand new, there's literally no one else in the universe who knows what you're going through or what it's all about other than your co-founder. So having a co-founder is kind of like having a little support group uh, in this like, new territory that you're trying to break open. And without that, it, just, it can get quite demoralizing. Um, so uh, I kind of picture it like that scene in Butch Casting, the Sundance Kid, where they, they hold hands before jumping off the cliff, right? That's the kind of feeling. <laughs> You're like, okay, this is kind of uncomfortable, but you know, <laughs> let's go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the single founder companies, you know, as programmers, we can all do it, but it's not great, right? It's lonely, and um, yeah, it's nice to have a little bit of support. There's another advantage, though. If you get another co-founder, you can try and find someone who rounds off your skill set. Right, so as programmers, we all probably are, you know, typically a bit reserved. You know, that'd be the, the normal kind of personality. Believe it or not, I'm reserved. Um, and uh, getting someone, if, if, that, if that does describe you, getting someone who's not, and as a first course of action, we'll pick up a phone and call someone, or cold call someone for an answer, instead of trying to, you know, you know write, write some code or put something on the internet to do some kind of quantitative, uh, you know, survey or research, right? <clears throat> That's what you know, I'd not, I, I would typically normally do. I think, okay, I'll try and solve this problem you know, with a program, when actually it's just much better if there's someone around you who's saying, I'll just call someone and see what they say, and call five people and see if there's consensus. It's just much faster. So uh, finding, if you're not very outgoing, finding someone who is outgoing, or if you are very outgoing, finding someone who's highly scientific and analytical, and trying to get that round, round off your group, that's, that's, that's completely invaluable. <clears throat> But what about more than two founders? I, a lot of companies have three or four founders, or five. Um, and I gotta say, I think that's a terrible idea. I think two is the perfect number. The problem with three founders, and I have been there, is uh, no matter how good you are as friends, starting off, uh, it's hard to stay that way. Because now you can have information asymmetry. You can have conversations that can happen behind someone else's back. Right? So you're in a position where either you try and maintain consensus by arranging for everyone to be in the same room for every single little idea, and now 60 or 80% of the company's time is spent debating over what bank to use for your bank account, right? because you have to arrange all the founders in the same room. Or you kind of say, screw it, this is a stupid decision, we're going to go ahead. And one founder comes in and says, you know, why the hell did we go with Bank of Ireland, you know, the online banking system shit? And you know, suddenly there's politics. So with three founders, it's very hard not to end up with you know, either politics or paralysis in your company. And I think that just gets worse as you add more. Um, people do get away with it, but only by really, really severely like, delineating people's responsibility. Um, another downside is you split the equity pile that much more. So you start off with every, everyone owning a third of the company, which is fine. But if you take an investment, or you take in several rounds of investment, everyone's pie gets much smaller, or their overall pie gets bigger, and everyone's slice gets uh, proportionately smaller. And uh, that could mean that after a few rounds of finance, you're kind of holding 40% of the, 14% of the company, maybe. And the investors don't like that because they look at you and think, you know, maybe that person is going to say, you know, I think now's a good time to step out and start a new company I own 100% of. Right? So with two founders, you might get diluted down to 25% or something like that after a few rounds of finance. But uh, with more than that, you know, it can suddenly just not feel like it's yours anymore. And that can be a problem. Yeah. Oh, one other point on co-founders, just to make it more difficult, is... Uh, well, one observation, Paul Graham, who owns, um, well, I don't know what owns, but runs the uh, accelerator program called Y Combinator in the United States, which is uh, known as being the best uh, accelerator for startups in the world. He says that uh, of the companies that go through that make it, he thinks all the co-founders have known each other for more than a year already by the time they get, they get into that. So that's another wrinkle. And the reason there, of course, is you know, it's an emotional environment. And if you don't know someone very well, don't have a lot in the bank, your first argument might be your last, and there'll be a lot of arguments. <coughs> um, in a good way, just passion, you know? But you kind of need to have a strong rapport with someone to get through that. 
Right, but co-founder, you want one, you know, you have to start eyeing people up. Now is good, you know, it's a good room. <laughs> um, so you got a mission, you got co-founders. A uh, really good idea, something to start doing is try to identify advisors. Everyone's always very free with their time uh, in terms of advising young startups. And uh, if you get good advisors, you can just import decades of experience into your company. Not just their experience, but also their networks and everyone they know. Um, so typically in a tech startup, you might get something like this. Um, take the optometrist example. So you deep dive into the optometrist thing and you're doing some machi machine vision thing. Maybe you want to get like the head of machine vision research group in a university as an advisor. Um, that'll keep you kind of up to date for free with all the latest stuff that's going on and probably keep you fed with good students coming out of that research group as well. Um, so that's someone from the tech angle. You know, if you're not already completely on top of the tech, you know, think about getting an advisor who just does it for a living. Um, another one is the market. If it's an optometrist kind of thing, you know, get an optometrist as, a, as an advisor or something like the person who's head of the optometrist uh, group of Ireland or <laughs> some kind of person in a position who can tell you a lot about the field, but also connect you with lots more of the market and tell you where you should be going to get visibility and give you a kind of route to getting those, to those customers and understanding them. <laughs> and then finally, get an, get, a, get an entrepreneur who's uh, maybe a bit ahead of you, um, has done it before and can just you know, guide you through some of the you know, inane <laughs> business crap, like you know, what stuff to listen to when the accountant says it and what stuff to ignore, um, uh, how to deal with lawyers, how to deal with investors, maybe someone who can provide an introductions to investors even. So these advisors are great. And then, then another kind is you can create a kind of like cloud of advisors through the entrepreneurial community itself by just going to you know, some of the pub meetups and getting to know people and just being free about your idea and telling them. That, gets it, that you can get your idea into 100 people's heads that way. And whether they like it or not, you've, you've kind of incepted them at that point. You know? And they're going off with that idea in the back of their heads, connecting it with, with opportunities for you, talking to people in their network and kind of finding stuff. You just, you just find stuff feeding back to you very, very quickly. So we're nearly there, right? The final point I would like to say about doing startups um, is that if you are going to do a startup, it, the goal is growth. And there's different kinds of companies, and some of them are what we call lifestyle companies, where it's small, but it's profitable, and everyone gets paid well, and everyone's quite happy and comfortable. But I really argue against, if you're going to do a startup, don't aim at that. Um, so one of these lifestyle companies, you know, that would be a shop or maybe a digital agency. And that's fine, right? But if you're doing new tech and you're trying to bring it to a market, why wouldn't you try and uh, build that company so you can try and uh, you, so you sell your product to as many customers as possible, try and turn it into you know a hundred million dollar company? The truth is that it's it's incredibly like risky both ways, right? If you're doing say I'll take a concrete example, say you're doing a niche technology company and you're thinking you know this is really cool tech and I want to do it, and I think there's maybe a hundred companies in the world who will buy this off me and they'll each buy it for ten grand. And you kind of go, sweet, that, that, that's potentially a million bucks I could make there. But the truth is, the same effort you put into that, if you slightly kind of like move it to the side or focus on some other customer, maybe you can sell it to you know, a million people, you know, or sell at 100 grand to 10,000 people, or basically go after some bigger opportunity. In both cases, you're taking a completely wild ass gamble, but going after the smaller pie is just really unprofessional gambling. Right? So, <laughs> If you're going to do a startup which involves bringing new, new tech into a new market or some combination of that, think about the biggest opportunity possible. Um, for us in Scalefront, like in the early stages of a conversation, we just ask ourselves as a, re as a reality check, can we make 10 million euro out of this, conceivably? And we're not really looking to prove it to ourselves that we can, but very often you can prove that you can't. Like you can do that back of envelope, cal that back of envelope calculation and say, all oh, right, there's like, only 100 people in the world who need this, and they only have about 10 grand, so maximum, when we're done with this, is we make a million quid, right? Which actually isn't a lot of money if it takes a few people a few years to do it. You're actually making less than you would in industry salaries at that point. So go after really big stuff. It's just as hard. I mean, it's no, it's no harder, um, but the payoffs are much better. Um, one way to look at this, uh, which is an interesting kind of, uh, thing I discovered in the last few years is how investors look at it. So investors are in this game as well, but they're kind of pulled back in taking a portfolio of you. Right? So you as the entrepreneur have to be fully passionate. And you have to believe it's going to work. Uh, but investors get to be a bit more cynical because they're not hands-on and don't need that blind passion to uh, kind of run with, the idea, run with the, uh, the idea. So from an investor's point of view, if they took 10 companies, what they generally expect is this. 
three of them are going to completely implode very, very quickly and lose all money. Uh, three of them will uh, end up being what they call the living dead companies, right? which is basically those lifestyle companies. Right? They got into a position where they're profitable and they pay everyone, but there's no way for them to grow. And to an investor, that's just taking up dead space in their portfolio. They won't die and they won't go anywhere. <coughs> three more companies they reckon will make a slight return, as in it won't be embarrassments, but aren't going to make a big impact. And then every investor has their fingers crossed for that one company that's going to pay for all the losses, right? Make so much money back that it'll cover everything else. So when you're talking to investors, they're saying, you know, they want to know that your company could potentially be that company that's going to save their ass because they know they need to maximize their chances of getting one of those companies in their portfolio of 10 companies. And they're smart, right? They're just, they're just taking like a longer term view and they have lots of experience. And as entrepreneurs, we should do the same thing. Only do it if you can really make it really big. And if you can't, do the next thing and try and make that really big as well. As well. There's never a shortage of, an ideas, of any ideas. Right, that's all I have. Uh, so in summary, there we go. Old me says, what lucky bastards, PyCon 2012. Um, I think you should be starting startups like me. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> well, we do everything in Python now. In, uh, so the transition wasn't demonware. Um, I used to give this talk about demonware, which is basically warts and all. I'm not sure if they like that anymore, especially now that I haven't been with the company for five years. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we, uh, when we started off, we did everything on C++, even on the server. We'd written our own C++ server to try and do high concurrency stuff. <laughs> Because things like Nginx weren't available then, you know, and we needed to figure out how to do all that async programming ourselves. And we only knew how to program in C++. And that was a real pain in the ass. And very, very quickly, no one would touch that code. It was just constantly crashed. And we had stuff just constantly restarting processes. And it was a complete mess. And um, <clears throat> yeah, basically, no one wanted to ever add a new feature to our main product because it would just explode in them. And that's when we made the shift to Python. And uh, we re-implemented re re all of the kind of database logic, all the application logic, basically, in uh, Python pretty quickly. Um, and we didn't do a great job because we were kind of learning Python at the same time. But on the plus side, we got it done really quick. And it worked. It just didn't go very fast. Um, and it was very fast to replace. So we did another revision. Um, maybe took about two months and rewrote everything because the code base is growing and the feature set was growing. But with Python, we were still able to replace it as we went, rather than being hit with a huge legacy cost of saying, God, we can't, we can't touch all that stuff. And we actually did that three times. So three complete from the ground up rewrites of the main product under the hood using Python. <coughs> and we couldn't even add a feature in C++ without you know, kind of crying. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was, that was pretty cool. Since then, um, everything we've done, everything I've done has been, has been in Python. Because you know you can use it for everything basically, which is cool. Shame about the JavaScript thing. You know, <laughs> I mean it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's, it's crappy, but uh, <laughs> we're stuck with it. Pity, pity it isn't Python, but yeah. I'm actually not a huge fan of the incubators or accelerators. Like they serve a purpose, right? But I think the main purpose they should serve is to give you a business network that you didn't have because you hadn't been doing this kind of thing before. Um, but to be honest, most of them don't do that very well. And instead, they focus on giving you like fancy office space <coughs> and a small amount of money, probably uh, money that's quite expensive in terms of equity in your company at that stage, and money that doesn't really change your life. Because if you're a programmer, you're very well paid anyway. And if you just adjust your lifestyle, you can save as much money as they would invest very quickly. So actually, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of accelerators. I do think, like, well, you can just read some books, uh, some very cool books that are out now, and learn everything that the accelerator might teach you. Um, like, that might be overtly taught to you in an accelerator uh, much faster. <coughs> so to get started, I, I think you actually need some savings just to be able to run at it for, by yourselves for six months or so. Um, a good way to do is there's tax schemes and stuff. You can take the savings and cycle them through the company to get some additional tax back. And then you can match that up. There's all these schemes for trying to like, take your savings and leverage it up with government grants. 
but I think basically the money has to come from you at the start. The good news is it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. You're not looking at trying to put in half a million or a million to get started anymore. You're really just looking at covering your own cost because all of your tools are free and your productivity is 10 times what it used to be. But I don't think you can get around needing you know, the personal reserves to be able to get through six months or so. Once you have something, you raise finance then. Once you have any customers and you can say, we're making progress to towards figuring out this formula. See, we know how to get customers. Those customers want this. Then you can begin to raise money. You can say, like, we got that much done. We have to figure out the pricing now, and we have to figure out how to optimize that. But fundamentally, once you can show, look, people want this. They're, they're taking it already. Investors will go, wow, OK, so there's something in there. That's a good one, sure. <laughs> A lot of people are actually kind of cycling the startups into the States, and there's a lot of companies that are kind of, when they are bringing in financing, they set up two arms, and one of the founders moves to the States and builds a commercial office, and the other one builds an engineering office here to try and get best of both worlds. Um, but I suppose the overall team is, what I'm saying is, it's kind of, this landscape's changing, right? So I was trying to, trying to predict, not necessarily where it is today, but where it might be in a couple of years. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a good few American uh, VC companies coming to Ireland, heavily supported by the government, but there's companies like uh, Polaris um, who have come here, supported by uh, the Pension Reserve Fund, actually. <coughs> <laughs> so let's hope they do well. Uh, <laughs> um, but the, the logic that these companies have is basically, you know, they want to find good companies to invest in, and they think that Europe is relatively untapped. So that's kind of like creeping over here a bit. Um, yeah, you, ultimately for yourself, you need to go wherever you, you need to. But the point is, I think less and less, there's less and less need for us all just to go to Silicon Valley. Um, yeah. And one other point is there's actually quite a lot of seed finance available in Ireland right now. There's so many government supports. The bank recapitalization put a ton of money into the banks under, uh, and some of it was earmarked for this kind of thing, and got given out to seed, seed funds, which are like mini VCs, uh, with the mandate that they had to spend it on small companies. And there's just a ton of that. So, for the number of companies that are here, there's like quite a lot of money going into seed rounds uh, relative to anywhere else you might be, except for the Valley, where there's just you know, millionaires everywhere who know what they're doing and can uh, kind of angel invest. <coughs> yeah, definitely. Why not? I mean, OK, here's, here's OK. I'm going to probably shoot myself in the foot in this one because we need to hire as well. But uh, <laughs> um, well, it suits different people. Some people just want to lead their own thing and know that's what they're doing anyway. And if that's who you are, you might as well just jump in the deep end and figure it out. Um, but if you're more turned on by the prospect of being able to build something new where nothing was there before, create maximum impact, just being in at the ground floor in any startup is, is good enough. The downside is you, you'll have relatively small equity participation. So, you know, if it gets sold for, you know, 10 million, as a, as a ground floor employee, you might, you might get a down payment on a house or, or, or a nice car or something. <laughs> but you won't retire. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, check out my blog. Uh, <laughs> um, no, well, I haven't written my own, and I'm a long way away from that. That sounds like a lot of hard work. Um, and I'd probably only get 70,000 distribution, like Dickens. Uh, but yeah, in terms of books, the best one out there, I think, is probably uh, Running Lean. It's called Running Lean. There's a thing called the Lean Startup Movement, which takes lean manufacturing, which was, God, I know, I, so I nearly went deep on that. I know a ton about it, because I think it's fascinating, but it's, it's what, Toyota did and revolutionized how manufacturing is done by trying to reduce waste and getting rid of inventory, <coughs> um, like spare inventory. And that's been applied to lots of things. Agile is a manifestation of that, especially things like continuous uh, integration, because you're not holding unused code kind of in the wings, but you get it out there immediately. So bad shit can't happen to it while it's just kind of waiting. <coughs> that's a lean principle. Lean startup is another one. And this movement has kind of given a language to a lot of these principles of of looking at the startup basically just as a series of experiments rather than a business. You know, if all you're trying to do is crack the formula, then everything you do is an experiment to try and teach you something about that formula. And looking at it from that perspective is very liberating and it's very constructive and there's books around it. 
the Lean Startup is one, and Running Lean is another. And Running Lean is a practical example of the same stuff from one guy's experience as he did it in his own company. So it's very readable. I think it is changing. It's not changed. I mean, I still can't explain it to my mum, you know? <laughs> um, so this uh, is probably a generational thing. But at least there are hundreds of us, and we understand. So in the past, basically, you know, no one understood. Uh, nowadays, your friends probably don't think, think you're probably slightly less crazy than they would have in the past. And there's lots of people to kind of sob over with a pint, you know, at one of these meetups. <laughs> So there is a, it's changing in the sense that there's people who, who understand now, but it's, I, I suppose it hasn't fully changed. That's very tough. I, I just I, I don't have a clear answer for that one because it, it takes a certain kind of insanity to run with it in the first place. So kind of how do you know when to stop <laughs> blindly believing in something? <laughs> you know? um, yeah, it's very hard to say. I mean, there's, there's no clear-cut answer. I think m maybe the most constructive thing I th could say is try to be careful about what you get into. So for instance, uh, some, like I've been in some companies that sell business to business, right? And uh, so enterprise software companies. It's actually what you know, Ireland has had some success at in the past. If you go back to the 90s, we had good software companies that sold to business, people like Iona. But there's a really negative aspect to that, which is it, it's, it takes really long to make a sale. You know, it can take nine months to kind of get through the process with a customer where they buy it. And from the outset, you can look at that and say, that business has really poor feedback. As in, you, you can't really tell quickly how you're doing because the customer is so slow in terms of coming back to you with anything. So personally, in order to, to get around this problem where you can be deep in one of these businesses and not know whether you should pull out because you don't know how it's doing, right? I've decided from the outset not to do that kind of business at all. Because you can just be like, okay, we're nine months in and we don't know how we're doing. We'll find out in nine months more. And then, you know, what do you do? It's just really bad, really bad feedback. So yeah, maybe you can just try and avoid getting into the situation, but if you are in the situation, it's very hard to tell. Maybe advisors can help you, you know? There's actually some um, assumptions in your question that, that are challenge. Okay. Um, like, uh, it's not just about building and then getting salespeople in to sell it. Salespeople aren't very innovative in themselves, right? You need to, all, when you start building out a sales team, you need to already know how to sell it yourself, right? You need to have built it for someone and know why they want it and know how to bring them through the sales process. That's the best way to do it for the founders, the people who are actually building the product ultimately and you know, the other person, the CEO, or, or whichever way it's configured, does the sales process initially. You just bring the sales team in to scale that process out. Once you know, like, find these kinds of people, say these words to them, and they will buy, right? <laughs> you give that script to the salespeople. So ideally, they're not separate things at the start. As in, don't, if possible, don't build anything until you're actually talking with a customer or a potential customer. So you kind of build it in partnership with conversations. That person might be, you might sell it to them later on when it's built. But hopefully, like, from the, if you just build, like, I've done this, right, so I've le learned it the hard way. In Demoware, no one says this, we built two things and threw them away before we landed on the right thing. Um, <clears throat> like, we, within four months, we'd thrown the, our, business model, our business plan out and the first product. Um, because we took that approach, we said, you know, people want, uh, you know, to do MMO games, and we have this advanced peer-to-peer -peer network that distributes all that traffic, right? And that's what we built in the first instance, because we thought it was cool. It turned out no one else, wa no one wanted it. Um, I wouldn't do that again, because what we could have done is first day said, okay, let's fly to the game studios, which we ended up doing anyway, and talk to them about the problems that they had. And if you have those relationships, you can just be on the phone or email to them throughout the sales, pro throughout the development process. So it's not like a do one and then do the other bit. But it's just kind of, it's all the one thing at the start. You have customers in the process, in the development process. Probably not. <laughs> well, you know, deep inside, all we wanted to do was get dream jobs in the games industry. We wanted to be like Havoc. You know, that's basically where it all came from. <laughs> and, uh, 
because, yeah, we knew those guys. They, we used to play Counter-Strike against them. And uh, then they disappeared one day. We were like, what the hell? Where have they gone? And then we were jealous. So we wanted to copy them, basically. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, you know, actually, I think we had this Irish mentality, to go back to the Irish mentality thing again. We didn't think that we could just go into the game studios and talk to them. We thought we needed something to go in with. So we spent, like five of us spent, whatever, four months building a prototype of this distributed peer-to-peer -peer <coughs> game thing, right? Uh, which was cool and all, but uh, we used that as a kind of thing to get into the game studios with. And that worked. So that's something, right? After that, the game studio said, we don't like that, but we like this little bit of it. Maybe you can just do it for like small games instead of massively multiplayer games. And after we did that, they said, maybe you can do web services and lobby stuff. Basically, they said, maybe you can do Xbox Live, but for PlayStation. We said, yeah, we'll do that. That's where we made our money. Um, <clears throat> so it got us in the door. But what I know in retrospect now is we could have just said, you know, we're not just little Irish guys who are afraid to go to America and talk to these guys. We could have just gone over with nothing and said, hey, look, we're funded, we're going to do something in this space, what are your problems? And just being confident about it, and it would have worked just as well. We could have skipped those four months. You know? You don't need to build it before they come. You can just really, you're as smart as anyone else in the world. You can just go in and have a conversation. Um, yeah, I was tempted once, but I thought better of it. Um, I think it's a whole different kind of career. In startups, MBAs are useless, right? That's one way of looking at it, right? The MBA is, came from like late 19th century kind of thinking, the Industrial Revolution, <coughs> and trying to codify that, right? How to run a big business, and it's great for that. But a startup isn't even a business, let alone a big business. You know, it's more of a, a scientific process. And only now, in the last couple of years, is any kind of literature emerg emerging around describing that scientific process. And that'll be the lean startup movement. <coughs> I think an MBA is useful maybe when you know what your business model is, you know what your product is, who your customer is, how to sell it to them, and you've got all that stuff tied in, and you're looking at scaling your business. Then MBA, that's, what, that's the kind of stuff that's properly taught in MBAs, taught in MBA programs. And maybe that's the time for that, but... <coughs> You know, to go down that route, I think that means I'd be looking at becoming a, a career CEO as opposed to a career founder. And I think the founder bit, the first three years, that's the fun bit. And it's also where the most value is made, and where you can personally make the most money. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's tough. I always get that one wrong as well. So the, so the question was, how do you find a balance between writing code that scales, or I suppose code for the long run, as opposed to code that just wants off to test something? God, I don't know. I, I always say to myself, you know, don't worry about the long run. We can always replace the code. It's not like it took as long to write it in the first place. But then I always find myself trying to do a good job, the best job possible in any given scenario, so I break my own rule. So <clears throat> that's like a bad answer to that question. It's probably more important to have good design than something that technically works <laughs> at the start. Because it's about communicating with the customer and seeing if they bite. But yeah, it's hard to hold yourself back if you like to do a good job, I find. Uh, unfortunately, less and less. But I still code, yeah. I was coding, well, this year I was coding up to, I suppose, March. And then just some other stuff happened, and I just needed to do all, like, a ton of more commercial stuff. But I've stayed involved in terms of um, kind of a bit of pair programming as the backseat driver here and there. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to do more. I, I think, I, like, you can pick it up from the talk. I think being able to code is, that's a real super skill in business now. Right? It means you can be independent. It also means you're highly analytical, right, in a way that other people aren't, right? You're like a like a trained kind of logic person. I don't, really don't want to lose that, but it is a challenge actually to try and, you know, uh, keep yourself programming while trying to balance all the other responsibilities. Uh, I actually, yeah, I, I think college is less and less relevant. For me, it was great for one thing, which is uh, co-founders. I mean, that's where the, the people who are around me raised my ambitions. And then I met great people, and then we realized we could start a company, and that's where it all started. But 
in terms of anything I learned, the lectures, the exams, it all just seems irrelevant at this point. You know, I, I got everything from a book that I read independently or by doing, and I think that's, <clears throat> that's more feasible than ever before, especially with things like Khan Academy and open courseware and all that stuff. You know, if there is something academic, you need to learn about data structures. It's so readily available now and from world-class lecturers instead of the likes of the people you find around here. So, <laughs> yeah, I think there's a shift away from college. I think colleges don't realize it yet because they're too slow moving, but they really have to try and prove their own relevance now, and I think they're failing. Independent work. You know, like, if they, if they learned to the program but not in college, they must have learned to program by doing something. So if you pointed stuff you did, you know, I don't think people will ask you about, you know, your grade. Presumably people will adapt. Like, think of Google, right? Uh, they've got extremely stringent hiring uh, requirements. But they must be missing out on some amazing people who just haven't got the formal qualifications because they were bored and they dropped out and did something instead, you know, instead of, you know, doing exams. And that's a real shame for Google. So you've got to presume that over the next number of years, either, you know, uh, that'll hit them really hard um, or they'll change. <clears throat> I'm going to quote uh, Steve Collins of Havoc, who answered a similar question once that I heard. He said, uh, computers are on the rise. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's changing, you know? Like, you got to, like, in some ways, you got to ask, like, maybe, maybe the nature of programming will change. It's certainly our increase in productivity could lead to a, a natural conclusion where you don't really need to type the code anymore, and it's more accessible to other people. But... I don't really buy that. I think the harder part of programming isn't the syntax or typing, you know, but it's actually being logical enough to be able to architect it and figure out how to put it together, how the data flows, and how to create the system around it. And I don't think, <coughs> I don't think we're going to have tools that will automatically do that for us anytime soon. So I think programmers can only remain relevant. And the broader skill set of being highly analytical, you know, that's, I don't know of any other profession that's really quite as good as programmers, you know, in terms of being able to tackle a problem and decompose it, you know, um, find a solution, all that kind of stuff that we learn nearly as a, as a, <clears throat> as a formal thing. And that's generally applicable everywhere. I, I, my, my intuition is there's definitely a strong aptitude there and people, you know, some people just can't picture the world. Maybe they just didn't play with Lego, you know? I think everyone played with Lego, right? <laughs> That seems to be a really strong predictor for who's a good programmer and who isn't a good programmer. So maybe, maybe that's that. I'm not sure.